the inaugurated this this year's uh, crash course. Um, I think this is the the third time around that we've, we've had this event, and uh, very much like to thank uh, John Baptiste and Anastasia and Dylan for organising it. I think it's a real. There are many wonderful things about about philosophy, philosophy of ethics, but one is that you know, so many people are willing to kind of turn out in their free time to listen to even more philosophy. I mean, you, you must really be at it. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk today about, about a very interesting uh, philosophy called... Uh, uh, oh, another thing I should say is that uh, periodically I will just stop for no apparent reason, and that's because they have to reload the camera, so don't, <laughs> they don't get worried about that. Um, I'm going to talk about Jean-Francois Lyotard. Uh, those, uh, those are his dates up there. And uh, Lyotard's very much uh, regarded as one of this uh, gen generation of, of, of post-structuralists, very influential generation of philosophers who include people like uh, uh, Gilles Deleuze, Jacques Derrida, and the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, uh, who came to fame uh, in, in the 1960s, and uh, as I'm sure many of you know, it was just a sort of incredible uh, constellation of talent, philosophical talent, if not genius, uh, in Paris at that time. Uh, Lyotard has a quite distinctive and interesting trajectory uh, within the overall trajectory of, uh, of post-structuralism. Post uh, those are some uh, basic uh, point de repair, as they say in French, and reference points. Uh, he was born in Versailles in the outskirts of Paris. He studied at the Sorbonne. Uh, he taught at a, when, when you get the aggregation in in in, uh, in, in France, which is the sort of higher uh, philosophy degree. Then the first thing you do is teach in a lycée. You teach in a grammar school because uh, philosophy is taught in the last in, in grammar schools in France. So that's what Lyotard did. He was uh, he taught at a lycée in Algeria. Uh, and in 1954, he, he joined this far-left group called Socialisme Barbarie. Uh, other very prominent members of that group were people like Cornelius Castoriadis and uh, Claude Lefort. And uh, they were very, very strongly opposed to the French colonial war in Algeria, which um, <coughs> Lyotard obviously knew at first hand. So uh, throughout the 50s, and in fact most of the 60s, uh, he was writing predominantly sort of political stuff uh, for socialism in Barbary. Although in 1954 he did write a little introduction to uh, phenomenology. Um, and then in 1971 he published this book called Discours Figure, which I, is the book that I'm going to talk about uh, today. I think it's in many ways his most interesting and most most enduring philosophical achievement. And then in 74, he published a book called Economie Libidinale, which has a lot of similarities in its basic philosophical outlook with uh, the kinds of arguments that you find in the anti Oedipus of, of Deleuze and Guattari, which was published about the same time. And then he really became world famous in 79 when he published a little book called La Condition Postmoderne. And uh, at that time, the word postmodern and postmodernity was on everyone's lips. It was the latest uh, trend in cultural analysis, and, and Lyotard became very famous for uh, encapsulating uh, the idea of the postmodern in what he calls the end of grand narratives, by which he means sort of large scale narratives about the development of history and uh, usually of a progressive character. And then in 73, he published a a book called Le Différent, which in, uh, which in French doesn't mean difference, it means something more like point of dispute, the point of dispute, something like that. Um, I mean, there are similarities, there are um, uh, threads which go throughout his work, uh, but, but, but one, of the, uh, one of the features of Lyotard is that he's quite chameleon-like. Uh, he, um, he Hegel once said, uh, sort of in a put-down shelling, that that Schelling conducted his education in public. Uh, and uh, I think you could say something similar about Lyotard. Lyotard Le conducted his education in public. Uh, he kept changing his uh, position quite dramatically uh, from one book to the next. 
Um, and so these are really steps, stages on a journey in which his philosophical position changes considerably. Uh, but as I said, the book that I'm going to concentrate on is, is uh, uh, a discourse figure because it, uh, it raises a lot of very crucial uh, questions which are cent central to the whole, whole post-structural enterprise. Okay, uh, so what is, uh, what is Lietal talking about in discourse figure? Well, uh, Lietal had uh, attended Lacan seminars in the mid-1960s. In the mid-1960s, in, in the uh, in the uh, you know, Lacan was terribly fashionable. If you were anybody, you had to go to his se uh, seminar. And, uh, however, Lacan is one of the targets of, of Lietal in, in, in this, this discord figure. Um, the reason for that is that, uh, that, that Lyotard, Lyotard thinks that the, the structuralist model of language has been overextended, it has been stretched beyond its capacity in writers like Lacan and in the, the, indeed like Derrida. So this touches on the relation between structuralism and post-structuralism. And you, I suppose one way of putting this would be to say, well, there's a first phase of, of, um, of post-structuralism in which, as it were, the structuralist notion of language is, is put into motion. It's made more mobile, it's made more dynamic uh, than it is in, in the, the sort of structuralism which was popularized by, by the anthropologist uh, Claude Levi Strauss in the late 50s, early 60s. But the essential model of language, the essential conception of what language is, is not really challenged. And, and, and one, of the, one of the things that, that Lyotard wants to do in discourse figure is actually to question that basic underlying uh, conception of language. So here you can see, for example, that Lacan, one of one of Lacan's uh, many uh, nomic utterances is that the, the unconscious is structured like a language. And uh, Jacques Derrida said a little sentence once, which has given rise to reams of debate. Uh, namely, that il n'y a pas de hors text, which uh, literally translated means something like there is nothing. Literally, it means there is no outside text. There is no outside text. But it's, it's often translated as there is nothing outside. But there is nothing outside the text. So uh, this, is, this is what Lyotard is not, not happy about. He doesn't like this. So uh, on the first page, the first page of the main text of Discord Figure, he says, this book protests that the given is not a text, that there is within it a constitutive thickness, or rather a difference, which is not to be read, but to be seen. That this difference and the immobile mobility which reveals it is what is constantly forgotten in the signifier. So that's like a kind of declaration of war, really, against uh, the, the, the post-structuralists, uh, uh, insofar as they're still uh, wedded to this uh, linguistic paradigm whose origins we'll look at in a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, so a little bit later he says something similar. He says, we can move to the figure, we'll see a bit later in more detail when we meet by the figure, by showing that every discourse has that which confronts it, the object of which it speaks, which is over there as what is designated within a horizon, a view on the edge of discourse. Okay. So he's playing off the idea of, of a view or, or what is seen uh, against the idea of the, uh, uh, the signifier. Uh, so one, of course, one philosophical question which is coming up at this point would be, well, is he being naive? You know, Derrida says in Yapa the old text. So how can how can Lyotard appeal to something which is old text without being naive about the relation between? between language and, and, and the world. So that's obviously a, a, an issue to bear in mind. Right, so in order to understand what he's attacking here, we have to look a little bit closer at the, at the structuralist model of language. Uh, essentially what happened is that uh, back in the early years of the, um, of the 20th century, a, a very influential book was published, uh, posthumously, called Course in General Linguistics, it's a book that was put together by the pupils of, of a famous Swiss linguist called Ferdinand de Saussure, those are the dates up there. Uh, 
And uh, I mean, this had a tremendous influence on the development of linguistics itself as a science in the early years of the 20th century. Uh, but also what happened in France is that it was taken up by Claude lévi uh, the famous anthropologist in the post-war period, and uh, lévi strauss thought that he could apply something like Saussure's method of analysis to analyse anthropological data, uh, for example, kinship systems. Uh, and from then on it spread into a whole notion of semiotics. So Saussure himself had said that the study of language was simply one branch of a more general theory, which he called semiotics, which is the theory of signs. And so the idea was that semiotics could be applied across the whole sphere of culture. And this became a very influential idea in France, particularly in the late 50s and the early 1960s. So what are the basic principles of, of uh, sociolinguistics? linguistics? Well, the first thing is that language should be studied as a synchronic system. Uh, this is what uh, Saussure calls long, uh, as opposed to papal. By a synchronic, what, what, uh, what um, Saussure is arguing against there is the kind of um, um, historical linguistics or philology, which was very prominent in the, in the 19th century, whereby people studying language were interested in the evolution of language. And, and Saussure says, no, what I'm going to do is just take a chronological cross-section, as it were. What I'm interested in is how language functions as a system, as a, kind of a, as a synchronic system, by taking a kind of cross-section of language at a particular point in time. I'm not interested in history, I'm not interested in development, because those aspects of language can't be treated uh, systematically and they can't be treated scientifically. The next fundamental point he makes is that in language there are only differences. In language there are only differences. And so the point about this is that it does not matter how you pronounce the A in, in the word last. Well, in English, I mean, I'm from the middle, so I say last. Okay? But down here in the south you say last. Well, in the 18th century that would have been very rustic. I mean, you would have been a hayseed if you'd said last. <laughs> um, so those, those, those things change over time. But the, the point is that um, as long as it doesn't sound like lost, or as long as it doesn't sound like lest, you've got, you've got the word last or, or last. Okay? So all the, it doesn't matter ex exactly how you pronounce the vowel, as long as it doesn't get mixed up with these, these other vowels. Okay? So it doesn't have, there's no precise pronunciation of the, the vowel A, which is necessary in order to identify that word. That's what Saussure means by saying that, that in language um, there, are, there are only uh, differences. And uh, a very famous analogy he gives for this idea about language is, 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 is a particular train. So the 8.30 train to Geneva is the one that's before the 9 o'clock train and after the 8 o'clock train, but it doesn't mean it's made up of the same locomotive and the same carriages every day. The locomotive and the carriages are com can be completely different. So it's not the materiality of the train which makes it the 8.30, it's just its differential location in relation to uh, the, eight, the 9 o'clock train and the 8 o'clock train. So that's a pretty precise anal analogy for this idea that it's not specific Specific quality of the phoneme which counts, but just your ability to differentiate it from, from other phonemes. So that's what, what's meant, about, meant by the priority of differences. Okay. Now one very significant thing about this is that for so sure it applies also to, uh, to what he calls the signified as well as the signifier. So this is Saussure's so basic notion of what he calls a sign, which is the basis of his general semiotics. It's a, it's a conjunction of a signifier and a signifier. The signifier is the kind of materiality of the sign, so that could be the sound, it could be the graphic mark on paper or whatever it is. The signifier, there's a real bit of a puzzle about exactly what Saussure thinks the signifier is. But it's the kind of meaning aspect of the sign or, or what the sign stands for, as opposed to the material element which actually communicates the meaning or, 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 or affects the representation. 
So one consequence of Saussure's view, which again got, got the post structuralists very excited, was it's not just the signifier, as we've seen, which is uh, distinguished differentially, but also the signified. So I like to, as it were, dramatize this a little bit by saying that in French there's no such thing as a handle. There are no handles in France. Okay? Why not? Well, if it's on a drawer or a door, it's a point, une poignée. If it's on a bucket or a cup, it's une anse. If it's, on a, if it's on a water pump or a wheelbarrow, it's a bras. And if it's on a hammer, a spade, a knife, or a fork, it's in une manche. Okay? So they have four different words from what we, we call a handle. Um, so this, this, this shows you how not just the signified, but the signified is divided up differentially uh, within language. Similarly in France, they have two kinds of rivers. They have un fleuve and une rivière. A fleuve is a river which flows into the sea. Une rivière is a, is a river which doesn't. Okay? So we've got two different kinds of rivers that we don't have one. I'm feeling deprived. Uh, um, so that's, that's the basic idea. So this, this, um, this, if you like, was the kind of French way of making a point about, about language which comes into the English-speaking world, for example, via the later philosophy of Wittgenstein, where Wittgenstein shows that you can't understand language as attaching labels to pre-existing bits of the world. Okay? You just cannot draw that distinction between language and the world in the way that, uh, so you can't understand language representationally, as if you know the word the, the world the world object is out there and then you just stick labels on it. It doesn't work like that. The world is actually articulated by language. So in the English-speaking world, Wittgenstein was one of the people who taught us that, although you could have learned it from Hegel actually. Um, but uh, in, in France, it, ca it came through via, via, via Saussure. But, I mean, this is going to be worrying for Lyotard because it's going to suggest that, well, everything is structured by language. So what about, what is this relation between, uh, between seeing and, and reading uh, that he wants to put so much, uh, so much uh, emphasis on? So or speaking and seeing. The figural, the figural. He wants to talk about the figural. The figural is not the same as the literal. Literal in the literal sense of relating to letters. Okay? The figural and the, and, and the literal. So he says, uh, to speak is always to speak of something. And this dimension of reference, which the structuralist method neglects by hypothesis, is nothing other than the presence of the distanciation seen in the experience of discourse. Okay? So there's a, there's a dimension of reference uh, in language, uh, which is just not captured by the structuralist method. I mean, some critics of structuralism would say, this is because, actually, a structuralism it doesn't get as far as propositions. It doesn't get as far as you know, whole sentences. Uh, this is, in fact, the way that um, another, another French philosopher, uh, Paul Ricoeur, criticizes Derrida. Uh, he said, well, look, Jacques, you're still, you're still hung up on the sign, you know, the individual semiotic unit, but that's no good. You're not really going to get, get a grip on language until you start considering sentences as a whole. And sentences talk about stuff, okay? They refer to the world. Uh, and so you can't, you know, there's a kind of, uh, we get stuck in the starting blocks with structuralism. Uh, because we don't even move to that level in which we're talking about about the world. So this is this is this is one of the points that uh, that Leotard wants to make uh, to make here. So there's a, there's the presence of the distanciation of seeing in the experience of discourse. We've got seeing and we've got discourse. But what is this seeing and, and what is and what is seen? Now uh, in discourse figure, um, Leotard's very influenced by Merleau-Ponty. I mean, I said that his first book was about phenomenology, and he, he was very much raised, as all philosophers of his generation were, in the traditions of phenomenology and Hegelian Marxism. I mean, if you weren't a Hegelian Marxist, you were basically zilch uh, in, the, in, the, in the 1950s in France. And then it, it took people like uh, Foucault and Deleuze to sort of rebel against that, that whole kind of oppressive Hegelian Marxist thing. 
but um, the, his, Lyotard's outlook as, as a member of Socialism and Barbary was very much influenced by that, as well as by phenomenology, it's a kind of coalescence of phenomenology and Hegelian Marxism. And he's particularly interested in Merleau-Ponty, so he says, um, Merleau-Ponty takes, Lyotard takes from Merleau-Ponty the notion that seeing is the apprehension of a mobile or perceived world. You know, you remember that quote I gave you earlier on when he talks about a mobile immobility, a mobile immobility, or a mobile immobility, I can't remember. Um, what does he mean by that? Well, what he's, what, he, what he's referring to is the fact that the perceived world is constantly shifting and changing as you mo move around, but it's also immobile in the sense that you, as, a, as a, an experienced sub subject, are always at the center. You're always, as it were, the point of origin of what you experience and what you perceive. So there's a kind of paradoxical relation between immobility and mobility in, in the experience of the perceived world. So we, perceive, we apprehend a mobile perceived world in which the relation between elements is not differentially determined. So this is a basic point he wants to make. Perceived isn't what he calls, what Merleau-Ponty calls, an ambiguous field of horizons and distances. So one of the points that, um, that, that Lyotard is making there is that the elements of the perceived world, insofar as we can distinguish elements at all, and we probably can't radically distinguish elements, uh, those elements are not differentially related uh, in the way that uh, the elements of language are, uh, or the elements of a sem semiotic system are differentially related. Okay? So it, that's, that's a fundamental mistake that the, the, the post-structuralists are making. And when Derrida says things like, there's no such thing as perception, which is a bit of a striking claim to make, uh, uh, that he's saying that, the, Derrida means by that, there's no such thing as perception if, unless you acknowledge that the perceived is dif totally differentially, differentially structured, so there's no presence. But Lyotard rejects that. And uh, at this point in the book, anyway, he, he endorses Merleau-Ponty's notion that the perceived is an ambiguous field of horizons and distances. Now, one of the interesting things about Merleau-Ponty is that he doesn't completely deny that there is a differential element in perception. He does talk about this in his his second major posthumous work, which is called The Visible and the Invisible. So, Merleau-Ponty can see, for example, that, that, that this is the example I've given, the redness of a rose implicitly contrasts with the redness of a pillar box or the redness of a fire. So, so Merleau-Ponty concedes that when you experience a particular red, there is something differential going on in your mind. You're contrasting it with other experiences of red, different experiences of red, and that is a component, that is an element in your perception. But at the same time, he wants to say it's not the whole story. It's not the whole story. Uh, he wants to say there is also something intrinsic about the colour. So we, we could perhaps dramatise this and by saying, you know, could green or white signify passion as well as red does? Okay? I'm sure there are some perverse people out there who are going to argue that. that <laughs> uh, um, but, but the point is that um, the, you can't understand colour in purely differential terms. There's something intrinsic about quantity, quantity of colours, okay? And you can't you, could, you can't grasp that if you're you're operating on on, ex, on exclusively structuralist premises. Okay? So that's uh, that's one of the points that uh, that um, uh, Mendelssohn wants to make. And he says similarly, a line in a painting or a drawing does not signify in the same way, so I should say way, as writing which appears in the artwork. Writing erases itself in favour of its meaning. The figural resists such appropriation. Um, the figural resists such appropriation. Uh, well, he, at that point, um, uh, Leotard gives the example of a, of a painting by uh, Paul Clay called Fatal Jump in which Clay writes Fatal Jump at the bottom. I mean, Clay often writes stuff on his, on his paintings. And uh, what, the basic point he wants to make is that the writing, you don't absorb the writing, you don't grasp the meaning of the writing in the same way as you, as it were, encounter the actual figural character of the painting uh, or the drawing. So the figural resists appropriation where, you know, it's clearly the case, you know, you're, as you're listening to me now, you're not listening to me, you know, you're not listening to my Midlands accent. Okay? You may start to now, but you were listening to you were listening to what I was saying. Okay? You were absorbing the meaning. You were just going straight through the sound in order to get to the meaning, uh, and that's the way language operates uh, because of its conventionality. 
but I mean, these, these are all pretty obvious things, but you know, philosophers get into a kind of dogmatic trap, and they can't see anything that contradicts what they're insisting on. So this, you know, it may all seem very platitudinous, but this was quite radical for someone to say this at the, at the high point of the dominance of structuralism. Well, I couldn't find, um, I couldn't find a fatal jump online, but I did find their biting, okay? And in their biting, there's a, there's a kind of exclamation mark right in the, in, right in the middle of the, uh, uh, of the painting. That's another clay painting. So, uh, okay, you can, you can read, you can, you can, as it were, contemplate the exclamation, ex exclamation mark just as another figural element, but you also read it as an exclamation mark, okay? So when you read it as an exclamation mark, you're apprehending it in a different way than you are. It's, it's a great sort of joke in the middle of the painting. Um, you're apprehending it in a different way because it's a conventional sign. You know what an exclamation mark means. You can just immediately read off something from it. Whereas you could spend hours kind of looking at what's going on in that, in, in that painting. So, so that's, that's, the basic, uh, that's the basic point that uh, Leotard is trying to make there. Okay, so, so, so far, um, Leotard has been prosecuting what looks like a kind of uh, phenomenological critique of, of the excesses of, of linguistic structuralism and linguistic post-structuralism. Um, and leaning, leaning quite a lot on Merleau-Ponty. Uh, one of the kind of interesting things about the book, about this book, Figure, is that he kind of changes horses halfway through the book. Uh, so he starts right by riding Mello Ponti, and uh, he goes into the uh, he goes into what's it called the um, the the, um, the changing station, and he comes out riding on Freud. Uh, so um, so there's a kind of switch. There's a continuity, but there's also a switch uh, in, in the middle of the book. Um, and uh, so at a certain point, although he's used Mello Ponti. Uh, he, he starts to register a dissatisfaction with this phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenological approach. And what he, what he doesn't like is this kind of continuity or this kind of harmonistic elements of, um, of uh, Merleau-Ponty's thinking. So for example, Merleau-Ponty says things like, language realises in breaking the silence that which silence wished for yet could not, not obtain. So Merleau-Ponty is almost sort of saying, well, the silence, you know, the silent world of perception or whatever, it wants to speak, it wants to articulate itself, and, 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 and sort of language is that gift which enables it to, to express that articulation which is already implicit. So there's a continuity between language and the perceived world. Uh, so you find in, uh, very often you find in, particularly in late Merleau-Ponty, you find expressions like incarnate logos, incarnate logos. There's an incarnate logos or a proto-logos, if you like, uh, in the perceived world, which language teases out, which language crystallizes, but there's no radical break between, between uh, the, the, the perceived world and, and, uh, and language. Um, you might think that's a little bit too cozy. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a famous article by, by Jean-Paul Sartre on Merleau-Ponty, where uh, he, he basically says, Merleau-Ponty must have had a really happy childhood then, he must have had a really nice mum. Because <laughs> he thinks that everything just flows harmoniously together. Um, where, but what, where's the break? Where, where are the ruptures? Where, where, where is the antagonism? Where's the, um, where's the fragmentation? And. Um, that's that's sort of the that's the sort of criticism that that, that Leotard starts to articulate of this Merleau-Ponty position, um, part of the way about halfway through the book. So what, I think the, the, the what I'm calling the coup de génie, you know, the, the brilliant stroke in in Discord Figure, is to grasp the similarity between Merleau-Ponty's phenomenolo phenomenological description of the seed world and Freud's description of the primary process. Okay? So as some of you know, have been in my Freud class uh, this term, the primary process characterized by mobility of cathexis, instability and visuality, tendency towards hallucinatory satisfaction, as opposed to the fixed differences of long, 
which you could very much uh, connect with Freud's definition of the secondary process, which he says is bound, Freud says it's bound energy as opposed to free, 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 uh, free floating energy or free moving energy. So, so, so Lyotard is basically saying, look, there's a really striking parallel between the perceived world as it's described in Herbert's phenomenology and what, what Freud says about, about the primary process. And this is, this is really, this is really interesting. Uh, so at this point, we could say, however, that there is an element, I said that, that Leotard sat, on, sat in on, you know, attended Lacan's seminars in the 60s, uh, along with the rest of fashionable Paris. Um, but, but he has been influenced by Lacan's claim that language, as it were, cuts us off, cuts us off from primordial contact with things. Language does introduce a kind of cut, which Lacan theorizes as castration, uh, which you know, separates us from the perceived world. So there isn't, there isn't this kind of continuity uh, that Merleau-Ponty evokes, and Lacan says things like, the symbol is the death of the thing. I think that might be Malon, but anyway. Um, uh, uh, Lacan says it as well. Uh, so we're in, once we're installed in language, in some sense, we are cut off from the perceived world. But, 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 but Leotard doesn't want to endorse all the consequences that flow from this for a structuralist or a post-structuralist like Lacan. So Lacan says, for him, this does not mean that we are now installed exclusively within language, which forms a fully autonomous or, or transcendental domain. If you say language is transcendental, you're saying it's basically the a priori condition for our experience, so all our experience is structured by this, this a priori. And uh, Leotard want, doesn't want to draw that consequence from, from the Lacanian argument. So he thinks of things more, more in this kind of way. Um, he wants to say this tearing away, this is a, another Lacanian element, he wants to say this tearing away from this primordial immersion in the world, in which you could say there isn't really a clear separation between subject and object, between what is perceived and the perceiver. This is what Freud calls primal repression. This is primal repression. Okay? Um, but it doesn't work quite the way that Lacan suggested it, it works. So he says that the supposed doubling of the pre world by language does not, I've repeated that, sorry, does not simply open up the distance in which the eye is installed in the edge of discourse. This tearing away produces effects of distortion within discourse. A figure is installed in the depths of our speech, which operates as the matrix of these effects, which attacks our words in order to make them into forms and images. Uh, by entspeiung, the, the, the object is lost. By means of the fantasy, it is represented. Entspeiung is a word which goes back to Hegel and the German idealists, and it basically means uh, the process whereby we, as self-conscious beings, are separated off, cut off from, from, from the world which we might be immersed in primordially before we achieve you know, the self-consciousness which, which Hegel thinks is a uh, characteristic of spirit. So there's an inspiring, there's a direction, it's sometimes translated as direction, there's a direction, the object is lost, and then it's recently restored in the form of fantasy, but this fantasy uh, is not simply a linguistic phenomenon, it's not something that can be articulated purely linguistically. Uh, it actually has, it attacks our words. It's not expressed through our words, it attacks our words, okay? So that's a difference in, in Latin, um, um, Leotard's approach. So this is an example he gives. Um, you, he, imagines a, he imagines a flag uh, with, with the words Revolution d'Octobre written, written on them, okay? Uh, so I, I don't need to translate that, hopefully. Uh, uh, and then the flag, the flag starts flapping in the breeze, okay? And, and as it flaps in the breeze, it folds up uh, somewhat, it crunches up, and you can only perceive some of the letters. You can't perceive all the letters. And the only, you can, so you can only perceive R-E-V-O, then N, then D, apostrophe O-R, Revondor, which uh, translates, if you do a homophonic translation, becomes in French, which means letters three of gold, okay? 
So we've got from revolution to a letters dream of gold uh, uh, by this process of distortion of language, okay? This attacking of language by, by, by the fantasy. And this is very different from Lacan's conception. This is Lacan's basic uh, model of what he calls metaphor and metonymy, which are the two uh, dimensions of the dream work, which, which Freud describes as displacement and, and condensation. So Lacan's basic idea is that you have a subject uh, which can only articulate itself or only represent itself in a signifier. Uh, this is a kind of Sartrean element of Lacan, actually. As soon as it represents itself in terms of a signifier, it, it, it congeals. It, it's reified. It's no longer the subject. Okay. Uh, so then you need another signifier to try and grasp the subject, which has, as it were, disappeared in the signifier. That's what Lacan calls fading, okay? He uses the English word. The subject fades into the signifier, is absorbed by the signifier. Because the subject, the pure subject, subject is just lack for Lacan. Well, how do you represent lack? That's the sort of way of putting the problem. Uh, as soon as you represent lack in the signifier, it's no longer a lack. Okay, so then you need another signifier, and then you need another signifier, and another signifier. That's the way Lacan thinks that language works, and that's the way he thinks the relation between the subject and the language works. So Lacan says that the signifier is that which represents the subject for another signifier. Okay? He turns those signifier upside down, as it were. He likes turning things upside down. He says the signifier is that which represents the subject for another signifier. But what you don't get in Lacan is this kind of disruption. Uh, I think, um, that, that, that uh, Leotard illustrates uh, with, that, um, with that example of, of the flag, okay? Um, another example that he uses in the book. Um, so this is, Freud talk, uses the example um, of a rabus. He talks about a rabus, uh, Freud in the, in the Interpretation Dreams, you know, which is a picture puzzle. As, a, as his, a way of uh, illustrating how dreams work. And the point that Lacan is, ma sorry, Leotard is making is that you can't understand a rabus in purely semiotic terms, or you can't understand a rabus in purely differential sensorian uh, terms, okay? There's a figural element that you have to apprehend and make sense of, which isn't, uh, coded in the way that language is coded. So what, this is a French um, rabus, so we've got a nose surrounded by a circle of bees, okay? Uh, so that could be un nez, which is the French for nose, sain, which means surrounded in French, encircled as circle surrounded, un nez, sain, dabe, a nose surrounded by bees. Uh, well, homo homophonically, we can then get an essence de bay, which is the French for a swarm of bees. Okay, so that's that's the solution to Rebus. Uh, but but Leotard's point is that that you can't do that. The sand bit, the surrounded bit, is is just is figural. You can only apprehend that figurally. It's not it's not um, it's not differential differential differentially coded in the way that the uh, <coughs> linguistic expressions are differentially coded. So he thinks that uh, there's just something seriously wrong with this exclusive concentration on language, both in relation to our experience of the perceived world, but also in relation to uh, the understanding of the unconscious. And of course he wants to say that uh, his interpretation is much closer to Freud, and to Freud's distinction between primary and secondary process, than it is to the kind of Lacanian version of Freud which becomes much too linguistic. So that's the basic point that he, uh, that, that he wants to make there. Okay, so I'm just uh, getting close to the end now. Um, so we've had the, the Merleau-Pontian arguments about perception, the relation between language and perception. Then we've had the, the arguments about the nature of uh, the unconscious, in which he's tackling Lacan. Uh, the, but discal figure is basically a work of aesthetics. What what uh, what uh, Leotard is heading towards is is a is a theory of the work of art. So this is what he's uh, what he, I wanted to say a little bit now. And uh, the basic mechanism that he 
he thinks he's uh, operating work, works of art, or maybe it's just modernist works of art, I'm not sure whether this has some kind of temporal restriction. It's what he calls renversement or reversal, okay? So, reversal. The wit, he says, the work of art exposes the gap between the discursive and the figural, okay? So, there's a gap between the discursive and the figural, which, as we saw, um, structuralism and post-structuralism can't take account of, um, uh, and, the, and the, the, what the work of art does is, as it were, to highlight this gap between the discursive and the figural. So it lays bare the disorder of the unconscious rather than absorbing it into a hallucinatory fulfillment. So in fantasy, uh, the, um, the, there's, a, there's a function of hallucinate, hallucinatory fulfillment. This, this difference, this gap is absorbed into the, fan, the, the fantasy representation uh, and we get absorbed into it. Uh, it doesn't highlight it, this, this disjunction. So he says that the artist does not produce outside the systems of internal figures, but is someone who tries to struggle in order to deliver in the fantasy, in the matrix of figures of which he's the location and the inheritor, that which is, in the proper sense, primary process and not repetition or writing. He's obviously referring to, that's an allusion to Derrida. Uh, I mean, French philosophers very, very rarely sort of have polite debates in journals, you know, where they argue against each other's positions. But they just put in a kind of nasty footnote, <laughs> and they often don't even, you know, say who they're referring to. Uh, so uh, that, that's what Lyotard is doing there. You know, that one word is, is a kind of, there you are. So, so they. So that which is in the proper sense, primary process and not repetition or writing, uh, the fantasy makes opposition out of difference. Uh, by opposition, Leotard here means a differential relation in the structural sense. So the fantasy makes opposition out of difference. In other words, there's a difference between the figural and the discursive, which is absorbed by the fantasy. Uh, whereas uh, poetics remakes difference with this opposition. So poetics remakes difference out of the opposition between the absorption of difference into opposition and the refusal of difference to be absorbed into opposition. That's his basic conception of what poetics or what the work of art does. Okay? So there's an element of disruption uh, in, in the work of art which is displayed uh, in a way, in a way, it's sort of displaying its own limit. It's displaying its own, and this fits much better, perhaps. But when Mikhail would say more about this, with kind of modernist conceptions of art than it does maybe with with earlier phases in the history of art. I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, so, so as it were, I mean, it's very close in a way to Adorno's aesthetics. You know, Adorno is very hostile to sort of. Um, notions of aesthetic harmony, notions of aesthetic unity. Uh, he thinks it's fine if you just listen to one movement of a Beethoven symphony. You don't have to feel embarrassed that you're listening to classic FM. Uh, because, um, you know, fragmentation is the name of the game. Uh, so um, so that's, that's all part of, you know, the, the fact that the work of art is highlighting its own lack of Harmony and integrality is, 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 is an important feature of it. So that's basically what Leotard is also theorizing in this in this kind of view. Okay. Last slide. Okay. Uh, so this was obviously he was obviously Leotard was very uh, uh, involved. You know he was in socialism with Barbary, and then he was a teacher at Nanterre in the 60s, where they had uh, massive. Um, you know, was, which was the epicenter of the student movement uh, in '68 and the workers and student movement. He was very, very deeply involved in it. Um, here are some lovely posters from that uh, from that epoch. Beauty is in the street. That one says, uh, "The struggle continues. Reform, chloroform." Um, um, so the last move that, that Leotard makes, he only really gestures towards it in Discord Figure, is to say that the kinds of the kind of street theatre and the kind of disruptive forms of political demonstration activity 
uh, which the sort of he was in he was involved in something called the movement, the 22nd of May movement. March, sorry, the 22nd of March movement. Uh, uh, has it has an ana analogy to this disrupt disruptive process of the work of art. So the, you're actually breaking through the kind of uh, the kind of glassy spectacle of advanced capitalism. You're disrupting its routines. It's kind of semiotic fixity, and you're allowing this kind of pr primary process uh, to come to the surface. So he thinks there's a kind of analogy between the kind of um, uh, you know street theatre, theater, political activity that he was involved in, and his theorisation of the work of art. And just to make one a final point about how clever Leotard is, the title of the book, Discourse Figure, is itself figural. Okay. It's a figuration of the difference between discourse and figure. It's not just a semi it's not just a, a linguistic or semiotic statement of the relation between discourse and figure. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much. Something green, apprehending greenness. It's not the same as saying that is green. I mean, in a way, it goes back to hey, you know, the first chapter of the phenomenology, set certainty. Uh, you know, these these um, these questions have been going around for a long time. Um, but is there something phenomenological there that uh, you can't? Uh, it's not can't be purely absorbed into language. And um, there's another point I was going to make. Oh, I've got that. Yeah, so that's 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 basically what he's that's basically what he's saying. Oh yes, I know. He says at one point that language is is the pheno the phenomenological, but not the ontological ground of the perceived world. Okay, that language is the phenomenological, but not the ontological ground of the perceived world. So in a way, he's saying yes. It's only because we are linguistic beings uh, that we uh, are capable of this kind of reflective form of of perception that we have, in which, you know, unlike an animal, we can actually say that's green, that's square, you know, whatever, that's 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 oblong or um, but that doesn't make language the ontological ground of the perceived world. That doesn't reduce the perceived world to language, even though language is a condition for us to have a perceived world, it doesn't make the perceived world the same as language. You know? That's that's the basic point. That. Yes. One is the one that you wrote, there is nothing outside the text, yes. and the other one, there is no outside the text. Yes. And, and I think there, is, there might be a difference there. I mean, uh -huh. There is nothing outside the text. Is is postulating the, the, yeah. the, the, that only, only, the only thing that exists yes. is, is language, yes. uh, whereas the other one doesn't say anything about necessarily about uh, Existence uh, yes. independent, independent of of, uh, of language. Right. I mean, not affirming, but not denying either. Uh, you mean when he says there is no outside text, you mean yeah, but no full text. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you see, it's it's a, it's a kind of tricky debate because a sort of Derrida would say, well, all 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 Derrida all, all Derrida is saying is there's nothing which is purely extra linguistic, or there's nothing which is purely non. There's nothing radically or text. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so that would that that would be go back to what I was saying a minute ago about the fact. Yes, uh, you know, language is a condition for for us to have the kind of perception that we do. Uh, but does that mean that everything is uh, is semi semiotically structured? Does that mean that everything is linguistically structured? And uh, I think that what you don't find in Derrida is a very strong claim in his early work, anyway that there is anything which is not linguistically structured or not differentially structured. Because his, his work, Derrida's word, différence, is like this kind of kind of inverted version of, her, of a first principle. I know you probably disagree with this, but this is my reading of it. It's, it's a kind of back-to-front, topsy-turvy, you know, primordial principle, uh, which means that, that he's saying everything is generated by différence, and uh, and, uh, and and that's that's that is really where the dividing line is because, as I said when I was talking about 
colour perception. Uh, even though Merleau-Ponty acknowledges there is a differential uh, element to colour perception, he doesn't think he goes all the way down. You know, the, the, the quality of colours or the meaning of colours is not purely differential. Red is not what it is just because it's different from green and yellow. It has an inherent quality. And uh, if, you, if you think that there is some uh, anti-principle called difference, you can't really, you can't really take account of that. Um, I was wondering if you could clarify how exactly the work of art shows us the opposition or, or makes this opposition and also how the perceiver of art experiences this. So is it experienced as a rupture yes. or more of a, as a sort of clarificatory type thing? Yes. Um, and if you could give some more examples of works of art that would help us understand how yes. this different shows up. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, um, I mean, what, what basically what he's saying is that um, 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 that 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 a work of art is not just um, the full fulfilment of a fantasy. Okay. Um, so, you know, he, as I said during, you know, during the talk, he was very politically active at this time. So he, he's obviously comparing sort of what he regards as, you know, genuine artworks. We say, for example, advertising or the whole kind of discourse of, of consumer capitalism, which is about offering people fantasies uh, in which they can kind of fulfill various kinds of drives. And so the, the basic point he's making is that you can't, there's something about the work of art that resists that. You know, you can't, you can't just see this as the fulfillment of a fantasy. Uh, it keep, however, you, however you try to interpret it, there's something that doesn't fit, there's something that, uh, that kind of disrupts your interpretation. There's always another element, there's always a different element. Uh, so you can never fully assimil assimilate it uh, to some kind of just, you know, fantasy fulfillment, whatever it might be. Yeah? Um, so, uh, but and and the very the very figural element of, of of art, which is something that you have to dwell on, that you can't just absorb, uh, is itself a kind of resistance to this kind of omnipresence of semiotics. That's 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 the point. Any questions? So yes, there's a figural element in poetry as well, but the figural element is not in the language as such. It's not in the way that the language works on, on, on the purely kind of differential sociorian level. It's in the kinds of um, the kinds of um, images that are coming up in the language, and the kind of disjunctions between images, and uh, uh, that's. That's that's where the, uh, the figure element 
configurable elements is coming up. Um, That's not only poetry or literature, right? No, no. But, but he's, he's very much um, uh, concentrating on the visual arts. You know, that, that was his particular interest, and he wrote a lot about, about the visual arts. Not just in this book, but he wrote about Marcel. He published a whole book about Marcel Duchamp. He wrote a lot of essays about painting and drawing. So that's, that was his sort of primary interest. Uh, but obviously, you have to be able to extend that and, and to say, well, you find the same thing in music, you, you find the same thing in literature. Uh, but, but what he would be highlighting is this, um, this deliberate disruption of harmony, like, you know, the use of dissonance in, in sort of 20th century music, sort of from sort of Schoenberg onwards, or even earlier than that, actually. Um, the use of dissonance, the use of, of clashes, the use of, of sort of, uh, sort of friction and conflict between different elements, which you can't fully recognize can't fully re reconcile into a kind of nice harmon harmonious whole. Yeah? But that's very much part of the kind of aesthetics of modernism, I think, in, in, in general. That you kind of eschew the idea of a kind of harmonious totality, which was the way that um, sort of uh, romantic, well, not, no, actually not romantic, because you already find that in Schlegel, you already find it in the, in the German romantics, this kind of celebration of the fragment. Uh, but going back to classical aesthetics, it's all about harmony and integration and so on and so forth. And that's what he's, that's what he's uh, arguing against. <coughs> so, uh, once again with the figure of... Uh, <laughs> is it, is it, does it somehow map onto uh, Merlot of this notion of uh, chiasm? Chiasm? Yeah. Is it, is it similar? And if, if that's the case, does it also work as this sort of repository of sort of software where text that wires stuff or picks up stuff yeah. or, or what's the relation between the two? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, well chi chi chiasm is. Um, that's that's the term which is used in in, in Mello Ponti's late, later work, the uh, drawing, and it comes from the Greek. It comes from the Greek letter chi, which is written like that. So it, it's like it's it's almost like a, a cross, but it's not quite a cross because the two the two lines are different. Yeah, that's the letter, that's the letter chi. So. Um, what, what that means in, in Mello Ponti and in some other philosophers is that there's a kind of interchangeability, there's a kind of possibility of swapping positions, but it's not a pure symmetry. So uh, Mello Ponti wants to say things like, um, you know, the world, the world, I look at the world and the world looks back at me, and uh, there's no strict, there's no strict distinction between the perceiver and the perceived. Um, so. Um, in a way, he's trying to dig down to this level. I mean, as so many philosophers do, really. I mean, particularly 20th century philosophers, prior to the the, the kind of categorical <coughs> distinction between subjects and objects. You know, so this is what, in a way, connects phenomenology with German idealism. You know, what you know, there's a famous um, uh, there's a book by a Hungarian psychoanalyst called uh, uh, Edith Barlent, which is called Before I Was I. Yeah? That's the title of the book. And, and that's kind of what, what, what sort of Mel Ponty phenomenology is interested in, or that's what sort of Schelling and Hegel are interested in. You know, well, before, what was there before I was on? Uh, and that means before there was this distinction between me over here and the world over there. Yeah? We can't take that as primordial. So uh, that's what, that's what, um, that's what Merleau Ponty means by the chiasm. You know, there's a kind of swapping backwards and forwards between subjects and objects. But it, it can't be purely symmetrical because you know, I'm still the see perceiving subject. There's still a kind of weight on the side of the perceiving subject. I mean, those of you who've studied, um, I mean, John is keen unity of apperception, the synthetic and the analytic unity of apperception. <laughs> is the synthetic unity dependent on the analytic unity or is it the other way around? 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, or are they interdependent? Well, it's both. Oh, damn it. <laughs> They're interdependent, but one is also wearing the trousers. Uh, so it's a sort of similar kind of similar kind of thing here. Uh, but but what uh, but but what Meloponti what so, what Leotard doesn't like you know comes to disagree with is he thinks in Meloponti this is too harmonistic. You know there's this kind of nice cosy interchange between me and the world, and I'm bathing in this kind of perceptual sort of soup. Uh, um, uh, so where's, where's this disruptive, um, where's the uncanny, what Freud calls the uncanny, the unheimly? Where's the uncanny, disruptive, uh, anxiety generating, disruptive aspect of fantasy? He thinks that that's lacking in other parties, so that's, that's why he sort of moves on so, to, to a more Freudian perspective. But I, I, in the uh, visible and the invisible, like Matrofoti, I think, are the first to, to the Kayas and Master. Uh, in between of the, of the intersense of mm -hmm. but as no link in any language, mm -hmm. uh, it cannot be, it, it can only be pointed towards the person this function. Well, so far as it is in the text, uh, so, so sounds a bit like what Leo does is similar. I understand that uh, as you put it, the metaphor yeah. changing of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Since since the metaphor thing itself is also really account for for yeah. the anxiety as you put it, but it does seem to map all the like, like, Yeah. Well, all I can do is repeat what I said a minute ago, that the Leotard, Leotard thinks there isn't a sufficiently disruptive element in the Melo point of view. So, I mean, uh, I mean, so it is the case, if you read Lake Melo Portin, if you, for example, read the, um, the notes, uh, the, uh, you know, the working notes to the visible and the invisible. So, uh, this, you know, the invisible and invisible was, was not finished at his death, it was published post posthumously, so there were a lot of notes at the back of the book, little fragments of things that he put down. He talks about things like the, the incarnate logos and so forth. So, I mean, the, it, it's not um, dissimilar to this current debate in post-analytical philosophy between McDowell and some of his critics, you know, about whether there is any such thing as non-perceptual content. You know, it's sort of related to that. Uh, and uh, and uh, sort of Merleau Ponty say he wants a sort of halfway position. Well, we don't want to say that the the, the pre-linguistic, pre-conceptual world is totally conceptually structured, but it's kind of proto-conceptual. That's what he means by talking about the incarnate logos. It's already got some kind of proto-articulation. Which, which um, language then, as it were, brings to fulfilment. That's the kind of idea that Melaport has got. Whereas uh, Leotard, what decides he wants more friction. He, he wants more of a, a di disruptive relationship between this, um, you know, the, the, the figural and the discursive. So that's why he moves towards this Freudian model of primary secondary process. He thinks that that's uh, a sort of better way of trying to think about this relationship. Why would they do it? 
how does this work? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, the only the only thing I can think of to say in light of that is that um, I mean, I think Leah, I'm not sure whether Leotard explicitly endorses that view, but I think it's a logical consequence of his position because he's saying Saussurean type differential structures don't go all the way down. Okay, so he must be saying you know the figure all is not differential in the way that language is. So he must be saying something. About um, I mean, in Mel Ponty, I think all you could say is, well, um, yeah, there is, a, there is a differential quality which kind of inflects how you, that's the best way I can do it, it inflects how you perceive the colour, but it doesn't totally determine it. So that, uh, uh, you know, when you perceive a certain kind of red, then it is your perception, your response is inflected by different kinds of red, you know, there's, there's, the, there's the kind of pink of carnations, there's the red of blood, there's the, you know, the red of the British pillar box, and so on and so forth. So all these are somehow working differentially uh, 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 to kind of inflect your perception, qualify it if you like, but it can't go all the way down. There has to be an element which is just red, and it's just different from green. And this just kind of the phenomenological bottom line. As it were. Do you, do you sort of mean? Uh, so, okay, what is painting why the red doesn't go all the way up? You say the differences don't go all the way down. Right? Yes, yes. Why, why isn't there just you know, something intrinsically there about the red of the blood as opposed to something you know, which is just different from the I see what you mean. So, why doesn't it go all the way up? Yeah, I mean, you know, where does it stop? Oh, I see what you mean. There, there seems to be, I mean, if he wants to posit some sort of uh, mm -hmm. level of naive perception, yes. you know, you just have these colors that, mm -hmm. and yes. then you get to the level of discourse where you can yes. distinguish between violet and indigo yes. stuff. Is that the kind of thing that he's after, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. yeah, is I'm, there a more? Uh, we're talking about Malibu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have the book with me, but uh, if I did, I might be able to find the relevant section. Uh, but he does say, that, yeah, I mean, he does, you're right, I mean, you could go the other way and say, look, there's just the redness of blood and that's, that's phenomenologically basic and that experience owes nothing to contrast with different, you know, the red of my bottle of wine or the red of the, you know, the rose or whatever it might be. It's just phenom phenomenologically basic. Um, I mean, all I can do really is re repeat his position, he just thinks there it is, it's, is inflected by these that contrast with other experiences of the same color. But uh, I mean, um, are you adopting the position on this? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I am adopting the position that you can't have both. Right? <laughs> Either one or the other, but not both.